Okay, well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Ballin. In terms of announcements, uh, tomorrow we will have part two of the interview with uh, Dundas on his book, Explaining Mormonism. We had some technical difficulties last Saturday, but the interview was salvaged. So part two will be a discussion of the chapters on soteriology of his book. Uh, Tark Lacour has agreed to come on to give an overview of macroevolution from an LDS perspective, as well as a critique of a recent uh, creationist volume uh, on the philosophical problems purportedly of macroevolution, so be on the uh, outlook for that. Uh, I've reached out to Jeff McCullough of Hello Saints to have a dialogue on scripture and salvation, so uh, hopefully he'll respond. Um, he seems like a very nice chap, and he's been on Saints and Scripted, so hopefully he'll agree. And of course, the biggest news is Bolin is off to America. Uh, I fought the feds and the feds lost, so I have my... Um, meeting with the embassy on the 4th of November, which is a Friday. So if you're the praying type, pray that it goes well. I've been told it's um, more or less all over and done with, and they're just basically making sure I'm not a terrorist. So I'll shave the beard and I won't keep halal for a few weeks. Uh, I've just got cancelled already. Um, jo but joking aside, uh, do keep me in your prayers. Uh, today's episode is an episode I've been really looking forward to. It's going to be on a rather controversial issue, I agree, but hopefully we won't be... Uh, controversial ourselves in our discussion of it. Uh, it's going to be on the discussion of Latter-day Saints and abortion. And I have someone uh, who I greatly respect. He's produced a lot of really good blog posts and articles, uh, Nathaniel Givens. Uh, Nathaniel, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Uh, great. And as you can see, we're both in the uh, uh, facial furniture cup. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, before we discuss this uh, important issue, um, for those who may not know who you are, like maybe if you were to give like a brief biographical background, like uh, who you are, what's your education, what do you do for a living, and what's your main interests in the broad uh, spectrum of Mormon studies? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I've been kind of blogging and writing about Mormonism um, for a little over 20 years. Um, I am the uh, the son of Terrell and Fiona Givens, so yeah, that's not a coincidence. Just if anybody's questioning the last name, yeah, those are my parents. Um, so for me, I just kind of grew up thinking and talking about um, our faith. It was just a natural extension of that to start writing about it. Um, in fact, I just um, finished or have a book coming out right now. It's my first book that I co-wrote with my father called Into the Headwinds. Um, it's just about faith, um, why faith is difficult. Um, so that's coming out from Erdman's, which we're pretty excited about. Um, the actual release date is the is October the 18th. Um, but yeah, I write for Public Square. Um, I've had an article in Deseret Magazine just recently. Um, been on Real Clear Religion, have my own blog, just kind of write all over the place. Um, yeah. And I'll include a, uh, in the link to the, uh, to the show notes uh, the book you and Terrell have written, and also your blog and uh, your uh, author page on the public square and anything else you want to include as well. So as cool. I said, today is a topic I've been wanting to discuss for a while and I've uh, been wanting to get Nathaniel for a while. So uh, fortunately, uh, our uh, schedules have both um, met today and it's on the, it's going to be on a very tricky issue. So like if you're going to be a bit triggered or something like that, hopefully we won't be too uh, in your face about it. But this is an issue I'm very, anyone who follows my blog and knows me, I knows I'm very, um, I have certain thoughts on this, uh, and Nathaniel does as well, and it's the issue of abortion. And we'll be focusing mainly on the uh, abortion, particularly Latter-day Saints, and the topic of abortion. Uh, because a few weeks ago in the United States, of course, Roe versus Wade was turned over, and now it's going to be a state's issue, and there's debates about that. So it's in the limelight again. In my native Ireland, only about four years ago, uh, there was a referendum that actually legalized up to 12 weeks abortion. Uh, previously, you could ha only get one if you went to England and so forth. It was basically illegal in the Republic. Um, so for Latter-day Saints on both sides of the uh, world, uh, this has been like a hot topic, and it's a hot topic elsewhere as well. So um, hopefully it won't be an emotive issue. We're just going to be dealing with rather calmly. So please keep that in mind before you actually uh, automatically want to turn off. So um, Nathaniel, again, thanks for agreeing especially to come on to discuss this. Um, it'll be interesting to see my podcast gets cancelled after this, but uh, who cares? Uh, but so here's the uh, $64,000 question. Is actually the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints pro-choice, pro, pro abort uh, in the sense of like it supports abortion or pro-life as in it opposes abortion? Or is there nuance to this? Um, I honestly don't think there is a ton of nuance, although there's a little bit. The, the church is a pro-life institution, um, and there really isn't a lot of wiggle room around that. Okay, so what is, for you, the church being pro-life, um, what do you think that means? Yeah, so this is actually really important. Um, a lot of people treat pro-choice and pro-life as just kind of um, branding categories for pro-abortion and anti-abortion, um, and I don't think that's actually accurate. 
Um, so just to give a little bit of background, because I forgot to do this earlier, um, I kind of grew up in the pro-life movement. Um, my mom was actually very heavily active in the pro-life movement when I was growing up. She was the official spokesperson for the Virginia Society for Human Life, which is the state affiliate of the National Right to Life Convention, or sorry, Nat National Right to Life Committee, which is the oldest and largest pro-life organization in the United States. Um, so I you know, from a fairly early age was kind of exposed to the topic. I mean, not a whole lot, she, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't really trying to teach me or, or indoctrinate me, but I was, you know, there were meetings in the house. My mom held interviews. Um, and then when I got a little bit older, I would actually go with her to debates um, just as moral support and kind of just to be there. Uh, I even entered a, uh, an oratory contest when I was in high school and kind of won at the state level and went to one of the national right to life conventions and competed at the national level, did not place. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been pro-life my, my whole life. And the reason I mentioned that is because when you're in the movement, you really understand that it's not just about abortion, but that there's actually a real philosophical core to the pro-life movement that is really about respecting the sanctity of human life. Um, and that's not a buzzword. It's not you know, something that we say for marketing purposes, it's the actual genuine core of what it means to be pro-life. It's this attitude that every human being has innate dignity and deserves innate moral and legal consideration as a human being. And from that, you get opposition to abortion. You also get opposition to euthanasia or assisted suicide, which are other issues that are important to the pro-life movement. Um, other things that I think are really important to understand the pro-life movement, from that, you also get a very, very, very strong pro-disability community. So the overlap between the pro-life community and kind of the disability community, um, you know, children with Down syndrome, um, is very, very, I think the Venn, diag Venn diagram has a ton of overlap there. Um, because if you have a genuine and sincere commitment that all human beings deserve equal moral and legal consideration, then that's going to come into play when you're talking about people who have special needs. Um, and the pro-life movement puts its money where its mouth is. And I've seen that for decades growing up, um, how much love and care um, and, and support there is from the pro-life community for, the, for, for people with, with special needs. Um, so that's what it means to be pro-life. All right. In my, in my opinion, there, there are two real core aspects when it comes to abortion. First is this idea that I've been talking about, which is you've got this idea that you're committed to the sanctity of human life. And how does that relate to abortion? 95% or more of abortions are elective, which means the mother is healthy, the child is healthy, um, the, the, the pregnancy did not result from rape or incest, and the abortion is basically a method of birth control. If you believe in the sanctity of human life, you cannot accept abortion in those cases. And so that is really the core of the pro-life movement is when it comes to abortion. You have the sanctity of human life, and how does that apply? In these cases, you have to be against abortion. Now, there are edge cases, and we'll probably get into those a little bit, where the life of the mother is at risk or where the pregnancy results from rape and incest. And in my experience, even within the pro-life community, there is discussion about that. Um, and there isn't one um, position that everybody has to have. But you've got to be opposed to it in in in, in cases of, of elective abortion. And so, sorry, going back, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this long monologue. But when it comes to the church, that's exactly the church's position. The church opposes abortion in those cases. And if you look at the writings of, of the general authorities and general conference, they oppose it because of the sanctity of human life. So they have the right position and the right rationale. And that is why I say the church is unambiguously pro-life. Oh, thanks for that. And uh, by the way, take as long as you want. If we ever have to do like a part two to this um I'm more than happy to do that. But no, I appreciate like you sharing like your autobiographical details as to like your movement in the uh, pro-life. Just to be brief, like, so you know where I'm coming from, like, um, I was adopted at birth. Um, and I was born in 87 at the time when it wasn't actually too uncommon to go over to England on the boat to get an abortion. So like, uh, I'm really grateful my birth mother never actually went down that route. She went down the uh, adoption route. Um, my mother is very pro choice My dad is a traditional Catholic. So we had a very unusual, um, moral ethos. I was actually un kind of ambiguously pro choice like, yeah, it's wrong, but like if a woman chooses to and it's like out of duress like um, or something like that, it's better to have it legal, that kind of a uh, real naive uh, teenage teen until like I had a very powerful spiritual experience in 16 and I kind of got a bit more sanctified in my thinking, shall we say. And I've been pretty active in the pro-life movement since then, like I was pretty active all throughout my uh, years in the university in the pro-life movement. And um, so it's something I feel very strongly about as well, um, personally, as well as um, intellectually, if you will. So I do appreciate you sharing your uh, 
journey, if you will, in the pro-life movement. So when it comes to, say, the church, and we'll maybe like quote, give some representative quotations at the end of church leaders and where they're actually addressing all the topics we'll be discussing. Um, but of course, like the natural knee-jerk reaction for like some pretty naive Latter-day Saints who support either pro-choice or like frankly pro-abortion is like, well, uh, the church emphasizes libertarian free will, which it does. And we all have the right to choose you know, of course, to him choose the right, you know, and they want to choose the left. So Nathaniel, like, maybe the church, like, maybe leadership is, like, opposed to abortion, elective abortion, at least, and so forth. But shouldn't members of the church actually still have the right to be pro-choice? You know, um, not just, like, right from, like, say, the U.S. Constitution or whatever, but, like, from the right, even according to the church, to support abortion because they're just exercising their free will or their uh, free agency to choose that perspective. All right, so a couple of things on that. First, um, there are some people that you're never going to convince, no matter how many quotes you give them. Um, so is there wiggle room? Not really, but some people are going to think there is anyways. The church has been pretty emphatic that it's not just morally opposed to abortion, but it, that, that it is opposed to elective abortion um, as a political and legal matter as well. Uh, the church doesn't take position on specific legislation, so that much is true, and that's where you can find some of the um, the wiggle room, but you can find ensign articles and, and, and explicit commentary from general authorities in general conference. Um, and, and then uh, President Oaks even wrote basically just an explicit takedown of this idea that because we believe in free agency and libertarian free will, therefore we have to be pro-choice. So just as a matter of like, what does the church say in that? No, that's not the case. Um, and then when you get into like understanding why, um, I think the paradigm for understanding abortion, the simplest and most straightforward paradigm is to understand that abortion is homicide. Um, that's not the same thing as saying that abortion is murder. I don't say that abortion is murder because that's too general and it's and murder is just one type of homicide. Homicide refers to the killing of a human being. And there's absolutely no question scientifically that an abortion is the killing of a human being. So abortion is a form of homicide. And then you have to ask, well, how do we handle homicide when it comes you know, to born people? Um, is it always illegal? Is it always immoral? And the answer is no, actually, it's not. You can commit homicide in self-defense, and that's considered legally and morally justifiable. You can also, although this doesn't really relate to abortion directly, the, the church specifically says that killing um, in combat in a just war is is not considered um, murder. Um, so if you apply this paradigm of, okay, well, abortion is homicide, when is it legal? You know, when is it permissible? When is it not? You know, right off the bat, it becomes very clear that if you're talking about saving the life of a mother, um, that abortion in that case would be legally and morally permissible, um, just as it would be, you know, homicide and self-defense. Uh, and so you can actually get the church's positions from that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that once we brought up this issue of homicide, well, you know, how does free agency interact with homicide? Do you have a right to just go out and murder somebody? I mean, in the sense of, do you have the agency to do that? Yes. Does it follow from that, that we should make murder legal? No. So why is it any different when we come to this this issue of, of abortion? And that's why this whole, well, we have agency. Okay, but if, if, if agency is a reason not to make something um, illegal, then why does it just apply in abortion? Why wouldn't it apply for child abuse, embezzlement, you know, robbery, theft, murder, all these other cases? What What is it? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. There's, there's really no significant basis to the idea that because of agency and because of libertarian free will, therefore abortion should be legal. It just, it, it, it's a non-starter. No, I agree. It's a non-starter, but it, I'm sure you've come across the whole, uh, well, you know, church teaches free will, ergo, it's actually Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really popular just because of the rhetoric. Oh you know, yeah, it, it's rhetoric. Choice is but... very appealing and, and there's this emphasis on choice. And so because of that, yeah, an awful lot of Latter-day Saints, um, more than I would like, Although in defense of the church, we are one of the most pro-life demographics in the United States. Um, so by and large, we're, we're, we're doing okay. Um, but for those Latter-day Saints who, who want to find wiggle room, that's that's where they're going to look. No, but I would agree with you. Like, yes, the church does teach like libertarian free will. And in terms of your theology of salvation, that's central to like our eternal identity. But as you said, like, well, you know, why stop there? There's like a slippery slope, you know, if it's supports abortion and ergo should not be illegal or like um very restricted why not any, anything else and that's where you see the inconsistency in the interpretation of the doctrine as well as how it's played out functionally but you do raise the issue like say there's nuance to homicide homicide is uh 
all murder is homicide, but not all homicide is murder. You know, it's like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Uh, from what I remember from like creator primary school and like even in the scriptures you know and not to turn this into like a scriptural uh, less, uh, lesson if you will but for those listening like you even have that nuance even in the Old Testament like the commandment thou shalt not kill the Hebrew there refers to intentional homicide you know basically murder it doesn't refer to like say killing in self-defense which the church allows for or like if you're a combatant on against an enemy you know uh, I don't think like the allies were wrong for killing Nazis during a battle you know, uh, so there is nuance in both scripture and how it's played out in everyday life. So that there will be, but it still will be considered homicide of some type. So, yeah, so, and I think the, the the nuance is really important when you come back to the issue of abortion, because if you put it inside that paradigm of homicide, then you get away from the kind of black or white, all abortions must be categorized one way or another, because homicide is not even just justifiable homicide or murder. We also have manslaughter, and then we have different types of manslaughter, voluntary versus involuntary. And then within murder, if you're looking at most criminal statutes, you have first degree, second degree, third degree. So there's this idea that homicide is a spectrum, and at one extreme, it is perfectly permissible, morally and legal. And at the other extreme, it's just about the worst that you can do. But the whole spectrum in between is actually populated. There are different instances of falling along that spectrum where it's not legally or morally permissible, but it doesn't rise to the level of murder. And so if you have that kind of paradigm, then when you talk about abortion, you're able to have, I think, a little bit more of a nuanced conversation about the different circumstances around abortion um, and, and where they would fall on that continuum. Um, one argument I often hear, like when it comes to the inconsistency, and again, this is like one of those really stupid arguments, but it's so popular, you know, we might as well just like get out. It's like, well, pro-choice, pro-life people like ourselves are inconsistent because when it comes to ectopic pregnancy, I'm unaware of any pro-life person who opposes it. There might be like a loon in Alabama, but like when it comes to ectopic pregnancy, they say, well, it's okay to perform an abortion in that case. And you're going to see where the logic is going. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I've, I've actually had that again, thrown out against me. Perhaps you've had it thrown out, the whole ectopic pregnancy. And of course, like the, the, the need or the want to impute to pro-life people, such as ourselves and others, a level of like basically insanity. Like we hate women. It's basically uh, the bride... What's that novel they're all obsessed with? Um, oh, The Handmaid's Tale? Handmaid's Tale. It's basically we want to make them uh, baby-making machines and stuff like that. I haven't seen, read the book or watched the movie, but that's the trope that's rather popular. So, like, uh, what would you have to say to, like, uh, first of all, the ectopic pregnancy thing? But often associated with that, the want to impute, like, a level of um, fundamentalism or hatred of women and so forth to people who are active in the pro-life movement. Yeah, there, there's a lot going on here. Um, so first, I'm just going to like stipulate that the rhetoric gets very complicated because the definition of an abortion is not the same for like the dictionary definition versus the medical definition versus the legal definition. Um, and so I have come across plenty of pro-lifers who say they are opposed to abortion with no exception. Um, and so I think it's understandable to some extent when you're looking at kind of the mainstream press and they're like, these pro-life people are crazy. They want, uh, you know, no exceptions. That means that if you have an ectopic pregnancy, you can't get an abortion. But what happens is if you actually talk to these pro-lifers who are the no exception category, they're going to say, well, obviously the procedure that you have in the case of an ectopic pregnancy isn't an abortion. Okay, so you're saying we can have the thing that most people would call an abortion, you just really don't like the terminology. And so you, you get into these, these kind of confusing um, debates about what we're going to call things, and, and, and it gives me some genuine sympathy for people who are pro-choice when they're a little bit confused about how extreme the pro-life movement is. I do also think that there's, um, among some people who are more sophisticated on that side, there's kind of some motivated reasoning. Um, in the wake of the, the Dobbs decision um, with Roe v. Wade being overturned, uh, it, it has kind of been in their interest to portray this as much worse than it actually is. Because the situation prior, you know, under Roe was that functionally abortion was basically legal in America, more or less, you know, there's some technicalities, but was functionally legal for the full term, all nine months, for any reason. Um, and, and that's because of, you know, the, the definition of health was so broad that even if you put in health exception in there, it basically meant you might as well not have have the rule in the first place. And so the, the pro-choice side was defending a very, very, very extreme position for decades. And now that that's gone, they want to make it look like we've gone all the way to the opposite extreme. And so there's a little bit of motivated reasoning in there. Um, when it comes to just the consistency of the pro-life position, 
you know, it, if you're pro-life, it doesn't make any sense to oppose something like an abortion in a case where a woman's life is at risk, because then you're just going to end up killing two people instead of one. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. And that's why there are no pro-life people. And no, with a little asterisk that you can always find one crazy person. But there are practically no pro-life people who oppose abortion in all cases. It just doesn't exist. Um, are there some laws that are written poorly that might actually lead to that? Possibly. I don't know. I haven't read every single statute. And this is something else I was going to mention is, unfortunately, the pro-life activists are not the ones writing the laws. A lot of time, it's Republican politicians who may or may not care about being pro-life at all. They've just adopted that position because that's what you have to do to win as a Republican. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes folks like this, they want to signal how strongly Republican they are, and they write um, laws that even pro-life activists are like, whoa, 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 you, this, is, this is not where we want to go. So I'm not defending every pro-life law out there because um, my experience is there are some that are written sloppily and some that are just extreme because they're written by people who are trying to score points with the pro-life side without even understanding. It was like when, when Donald Trump was, was being interviewed when he was running as president. And there, there's no way anybody would believe that Donald Trump is actually a committed pro-life person. Just none whatsoever. And so, you know, at one point they asked him, do you think women should be prosecuted for having abortions? And he was like, yes. And he was saying yes, because he thought that's what the pro-life movement wants to hear. That's not the pro-life position. Generally speaking, pro-life activists do not want to prosecute women. Um, but he's just assuming that's what they want to hear, and so he says something extreme. And that kind of thing happens again and again, where you have positions that are trying to curry favor with the movement that they don't understand, and they adopt radical positions that the pro-life uh, movement itself doesn't uh, doesn't adopt. Oh, no, that's very good. And as I said, like uh, I know it's not like the best of arguments, but it's one of those ones that just won't die. The whole, well, you think ectopic pregnancy is acceptable, ergo you're well, inconsistent, so... The consistency argument has more power, I think, when moving away from the atopic pregnancy, because it's just, again, it's a non-starter there. It's, it's not, who cares? It's, it's anyways, it's, it, that's not even a rule. Um, but there are some people who would say, if you really believe that we are killing approximately 1 million babies every year, you would not be, um, you know, protesting this at, at the March for Life and trying to pass laws. You would be engaging in like an armed insurrection. Right. Because that's the level. If you are a pro-life person and you really think that all human beings are equally are, are, are equally worthwhile, then how can you possibly just try to oppose this legally? And I do think that as a consistency argument, that one is stronger. I disagree with it um, because what they're basically saying is that if you're pro-life, that you would try to overthrow the government. And that's not, you know, the, the cost there, you're basically saying if you're pro-life, you should start a civil war. And no, again, because you're talking about starting mass unrest that would lead to the collapse of the United States government potentially. And, and you know, who knows how many people would be killed in something like that. And it would not in the long run bring us to, to be the kind of society where abortion is not just illegal, but unthinkable. And that's what the pro-life movement really wants, right? The pro-life movement is not out there saying we want to ban abortions um, because we, we want to force people to not have them. The pro-life movement believes that there is a connection between law and culture, um, and that if you live in a country, and the United States under Roe was a country, where we're saying that it is a matter of, of Supreme Court decision that abortion is, is a fundamental right, that it is very, very hard to uh, get to the point where abortion is unthinkable. So we did need to, you know, we needed to overturn Roe. I'm very glad that it's been overturned. Abortion should be generally illegal. Uh, elect uh, elective abortions should generally be illegal. But the legal aspect is only half, if even that, of, of the conversation. It's really about educating people, for one thing, to understand fetal development, to understand the humanity of the unborn. And it's also about creating a society that supports women who are pregnant, um, who, who, who need help. Um, if the pro-life movement isn't actively doing those things, then it's not really the pro-life movement. And I'm going to again say that in my experience, the pro-life movement, the pro-life movement runs crisis pregnancy centers because they are genuinely trying to support women who are who are who are in need. The pro-life movement is some of the best people that I've ever met, and there's no doubt um, that they are really out there trying to do all they can to educate, to inform, and to help, and to provide aid and assistance. Um, but that message doesn't always get through to pro-life politicians who are just treating this as a checkbox so that they can get elected. Um, and for them, it's like, have I, have I you know, proposed a really strict anti-abortion law? Good, then, then I'm done. Um, and, and so there's this disconnect again between the pro-life movement and, and pro-life politicians who do not represent the movement very well sometimes.
I'm glad you said that. Um, you know, it's like the joke when it comes to politicians. You know, I hate all the jokes about bad politicians. It, it gives the one percent a bad name or something like that. Um, yeah, but um, I really like what you said about like um, you know the whole going to war. You know, I think all pro-life people who are convinced of the movement. Yeah, you know, it's it's wrong. You know, but at the same time, there's the idea like say just war theory. You know, um, even if you're convinced like you're going to stop one million abortions every year, and get me wrong, that's that's horrendous. If you were to go like uh, civil unrest and do like a uh, civil war, that would actually result in millions more innocent people. So, you know, there is the whole balancing act um, for those who are familiar with just war theory of, say, Aquinas. And like Mark Schindler actually had a very good article in Dialogue, I think, um, on a Latter-day Saint approach to just war. It would be incompatible with the idea of just war you find in the Bible and scriptures in Latter-day Saint theology. You know, so, but again, uh, that's like a caricature, you know, the whole redneck with his gun, you know, just wanting to overthrow the government, which he, again, there might be one or two out there, even in, uh, but I really doubt that's even a significant minority, you know, in the pro-life movement. Yeah, I mean, there are some because there have been abortion clinic bombings, and, yeah. and that's this logic. And and so I just brought it up because you were asking about the consistency argument, and to kind of steal me on the other side, the strong consistency argument is if you guys really thought that we were killing a bunch of babies, which I do think, but if you really thought that, then you would engage in violence to stop it. And that's a stronger argument, but it's still wrong. Oh, I agree. Um, it, uh, no, and I appreciate you like steel man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so I'm just yeah. trying to I'm just trying to give like a, a stronger argument on consistency, yeah. but it, it's still it, it's still not correct. But at yeah, least it's, it's not it, just dumb out of the gate. Yeah, and like I probably like if you think of like say the abortion bombings in like the say last fifty years, how many would there actually be? You know, um, there would be some, but like it would be f as rare as Hensteed, I'm guessing. Uh, it, it's been a a while. I, I remember the last one that, that that I that I knew about, and I and I. I haven't looked this up ahead of time, but I, I want to say it was at least 10 to maybe 20 years ago. Um, yeah, uh, and the pro-life movement unreservedly condemns violence in the interests of stopping abortion. Like, Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, and that's why they're so rare. Like half the yeah. country, I mean, half the country is pro-life, more or less. And yet violence against abortionists or against abortion clinics is incredibly rare. And that's because it's incompatible with the pro-life, um, with the actual pro-life ideology to, to go around murdering people. It's just that that's completely rejected. Okay, um, and a couple of years ago when they had a referendum here in Ireland, and you see this old trap when it comes to, say, the pro-life versus pro-choice debates, is often, not always, I don't want to seem like I'm trying to, like, um, uh, stereotype here, but often politicians who support uh, the pro-choice movement, as well as um, the people in the street, if you will, they often appeal to, like, say, rape, uh, con being conceived in rape or incest, you know, like the, and we'll get into, like, the church's position, uh, this is going to be a good segue, um, and they say, well, you know, in these cases, uh, I think all sides agree, at the very least, it can be debated. It could be not necessarily like an evil, you know, or at least a necessary evil to procure an abortion in this case. Ergo, the other 95% plus should be legal. Um, I'm, uh, it's kind of a bit of a slate of hand, but maybe if you were to address like why that's kind of pretty disingenuous uh, from many perspectives. Yeah, I mean, it, it just comes back to, to kind of what I said at the beginning. What's the definition of being pro-life? It's a commitment to the sanctity of human life. Um, and as applied to abortion, it means that you must oppose elective abortions, abortions as birth control, period. That's all it, impl uh, that's all it implies. But we've already talked about like the, the life of the mother exception where everybody agrees that abortion should be permissible. So that means that we, we, we've already said there are some cases where abortion should absolutely not be permiss uh, permissible and somewhere it, it should be. Um, and so if, if you're just thinking, oh, well, you know, sometimes one, sometimes the other, you know, let, let's cut it in the middle. But it's, it's really important to actually look at how many fall into those two categories. And again, you can look at the different statistics and I don't have any like that I've looked up, but I've been in this movement for enough years that I know approximately 90 percent on the low end to 95, 99 percent of abortions are elective. It means that not, no rape or incest, no severe fetal abnormality. Um, no threat to the to the woman's life or health. Other, you know, I, and I don't I, I don't want to state that too strongly because pregnancy is hard. I'm not saying it's like there's no cost whatsoever. I mean, so I, I don't want to overstate it. But but no no you know direct threat to the mother's life. Um, 95 99 percent of abortions fall into that category. And so of course the pro-choice side wants to say, but what about and, and bring up some tragic cases, some of which abortion generally should be legal in those cases. And they want to bring these up, but it just doesn't make any sense to say that because of this very very rare exceptional um, case, we should make it legal 
in all cases. It just it it, it doesn't follow from that. Like, do you believe? Go go back to the homicide thing because yeah. you're allowed to kill in self defense. Therefore, we should have no laws against murder. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's pretty absurd. Uh, would you agree that it's often used as an appeal to emotion? Because like, let's face it, like loads of humans are more emotionally centered and intellectually centered when it comes to the, uh, these type of issues. I mean, of course, it's an appeal to an emotion, but I don't rule out appeals to emotion. I think humans should be both rational and emotional. Um, yeah. And so I, I don't have, I mean, and, and when, look, when the pro life says it's a baby, that's also an appeal to an emotion, mm-hmm. um, which is why I usually just say human being. I usually try to stay out of the emotional stuff. Um, but yeah, obviously, it's an appeal to an emotion, but I don't actually have as much of a problem with that. No, f- fair enough. Um, and that's kind of a good segue because we talked about, like, say, the rare five percent or so exceptions, and that will go into, like, what is the church's official stance on this? Uh, if it's okay with you, I'll just read from the uh, current handbook, and then we can use that as a segue into, like, maybe discussing it and so forth. Uh, and this is from the uh, current handbook. The Lord commanded, Thou shalt not kill, nor do anything like unto it, and that's DNC 59 verse 6. The church opposes elective abortion for personal or social convenience. Members must not submit to perform, arrange, or pay for, consent to, or encourage an abortion. The only possible exceptions are when pregnancy resulted from forcible rape or incest, a competent physician determines that the life or health of the mother is in serious jeopardy, a competent physician determines that the fetus has severe defects that will not allow the baby to survive beyond birth. Even these exceptions do not automatically justify abortion. Abortion is a most serious matter. It should be considered only after the persons responsible have received confirmation through prayer. Members may counsel with their bishops as part of the process. Uh, and then it says, presiding officers carefully review the circumstances if a church member has in- been involved in abortion. A membership council may be necessary if a member submits to, performs, arranges for, pays for, consents to, encourages an abortion. However, a membership council should not be considered if a member was involved in abortion before baptism. And it kind of goes on, but that's basically um, the current handbook. And there's very similar statements in the Gospel Topics essay and many talks in the last number of decades um, coincident with the uh, Roe versus Wade and so forth um, by the Church at General Conference in uh, various articles in the Ensign and so forth. So uh, so as a TLDR, what, if you were to summarize what the Church teaches from this and other sources, how would you sum up the Church's view on abortion? I mean, it's just a mainstream, moderate pro-life position. Like, that's what they're saying. You know, don't have abortions for elective reasons, um, but they may be permissible, not guaranteed. They may be permissible in these, you know, the narrow exceptions that you just read out, which is as a, that's the pro-life position. Yeah, and um, I, I do like the fact that you emphasize that. Well, it's just even if they do fall under this uh, kind of exception, even then that doesn't mean ipso facto you should get an abortion. It's just like it's allowable, even if you think it's like the lesser of uh, many evils type of allowance, so forth. So, um, and I kind of let you knew in advance this would be the case, but like maybe play a bit devil's advocate and be like the ultra conservative, uh, difficult Latter Day Saint here. It's like, well, Nathaniel, don't be wrong. I'm glad the church opposes elective abortion. That's like ninety five percent or so. So there's no problem there. But let me come out with you. It's like, why should an abort? Why should a unborn child, you know, which is basically uh, what a fetus is, you know, it's developing. Why should that actually be punished for the sins of the father in the case of rape? Or why should it be killed? You know, I'm not trying to use emotive language, but you know, you know where I'm coming at when it comes to mm-hmm. saying, well, it's just because it might have birth defects, or it was produced in the case of incest. It's like, well, uh, don't they have this intrinsic right to life? You know, and, and I often come across this. Like, I'll, I'll admit, like. As someone who's very pro-choice, I pro-life. Jeez, uh, pro-life. Um, I'm going to get cancelled just for that. As someone who's actually pretty pro-life, I have wrestled and still kind of wrestle when it comes to these exceptions. Not that I'm like trying to publicly diss on the church, but like, um, how would you approach or answer someone who might raise these as objections to the exceptions? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's important first to note that in the exceptional cases, the church isn't ruling one way or the other either morally or advocating anything legally, the church is basically saying there are some very, very difficult cases. And in those cases, you know, we, we, we can't decide other than on a case by case basis. Um, and and I, I think when you understand it in those terms, even, you know, cause it, it's one thing to just blanket say, yeah, in the case of rape, abortion is fine. No problems. All, all just go ahead. Um, that's not what the church is saying. 
Um, the church is saying that in the case of a of, uh, of forcible rape or incest, I think forcible is just there to modify incest. So in the case where the pregnancy is non-voluntary, th then it may be permissible, not that it always is permissible. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's how I would kind of respond to, to, a, to a real conservative critique there. Okay, no, that's good. Um, and some, uh, again, to bring up the uh, pretty bad arguments you often hear from like errant Latter-day Saints, but sometimes they might appeal like, say, to that text in the Book of Mormon where Jesus, before he's born the day after, speaks in the New World, and they say, well, see here, like the human life, the human life does not actually begin until uh, the first breath he's drawn, or at least the day of birth, and so forth. I'm sure you've heard that argument. It's based on the Book of Mormon. Now, for me, that kind of begs many questions. First of all, it could be an angel speaking on behalf of Jesus, you know, the idea of a shaliak or an agent. But even if even if you think spirits only enter the body on the day of birth, that does not mean that what's developing in the uterus is not a human being who's sentient and can feel things. So it's kind of a, for me, it's pretty disingenuous. But do you have any comments on that pretty common uh, proof text used by um, pro Latter Latter-day Saints who justify their uh, perspective? Yeah, I, I think it's a little ironic um, because generally the pro-choice side is saying keep religion out of politics and that sometimes pro-choice Latter-day Saints will try to use our theology to argue one way or the other. Um, and our theology, to be honest, says nothing whatsoever about abortion. It just doesn't. Um, and I was trying to scan through uh, uh, President Oaks at one point actually just said that. He said that the church's position on abortion is not you know, a reflection of some kind of theology of ensoulment. Like, when does the soul enter the body? We don't know. And I just don't find that really relevant to a public policy discussion, because even if the church did have a really, you know, clear revelation on when the soul enters the body, why would that be the basis for making laws in the United States of America? Like, that that to me is, is a weird violation of, of the, the, the concept of the, the separation of church and state. Like, why would we try to legislate our theology? The church is not trying to legislate theology when it comes to abortion. Um, the question is, is the human being a human being? And, and the answer is yes. Um, so we're done here. Um, and if you look at, you know, you know, President uh, Nelson, you know, a medical doctor, in his talks, he's very, very emphatic that the reason for the church's opposition to abortion has nothing to do with some kind of revealed theology or some, you know, doctrine about installment. It's because a human life starts at conception, and that is a scientific and medical fact. Um, and so then you just have to ask the question, do you think it's okay to kill some human beings or not? And the church's position is that it's not. Um, and that comes down to the sanctity of human life. And the sanctity of human life actually doesn't depend on something specific about insolment. So it's 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 a weird position for Latter-day Saints to try to argue from the scriptures whether abortion should be legal or, or not um, based on some speculative theology uh, when we're just arguing based on human rights. And I do find it funny, um, not saying like all pro shies Latter-day Saints are like this, but many reject the Book of Mormon or the historicity, so it's kind of odd that they would appeal to a text that they think is 19th, purely 19th century uh, fiction to support their view. Uh, of course, not, hashtag not all liberals, but at the same time, it's kind of funny. But you kind of mentioned Nelson. Uh, he had an excellent uh, article in the Ensign in 2008, Abortion and Assault and Defenseless, and he kind of touches upon this, um, you know, the right to choose and stuff like that. When the controversies about abortion are debated, individual right of choice is invoked as though it were the one supreme virtue that could not that could only be true if but one person were involved the rights of any one individual do not allow the rights of another individual to be abused in or out of marriage abortion is not solely an individual matter terminating the life of a developing baby involves two individuals with separate bodies brains and hearts a woman's choice for her own body does not include the right to deprive her baby of life and lifetime of choices that her child would make and i think whatever you can say about nelson is one, because of his medical background, he does know more than the next person when it comes to gestation and other things like that. Even if his focus was on heart surgery, he definitely wouldn't know about embryology and so forth. And two, say what you will about him, like he definitely does know um, a lot about Latter-day Saint doctrine and theology, and I'm sure like the issue of insolment is not really a huge issue for him. Because even if, and I don't believe this is the case, but even if you want to go and proof text that text in the Book of Mormon and say, Jesus' spirit entered his, um, the baby in Mary's womb the day of the birth, and that's the case for all people as well. What's still developing in there is a person with brain uh, function and heartbeat and so forth. So the issue of insolment, I think, is like another dodge. That doesn't actually make someone a human being with your rights. And the irony is like trying to bring religion to like say something where there should be like sure state separation in their view. So uh, yeah, it's it's problematic, but as I said, like these are the type of arguments. And function 
for most cases, this is the best they can do scripturally, theologically, and even socially at times. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, I do appreciate your thoughts. I know you kind of uh, strapped for time, so like um, maybe as we uh, wrap things up, like um, and hopefully we can actually have you on for part two. You know, where we can actually have a fuller discussion if you're up for that. But in terms of say resources, you know, uh, what are there any, any books, articles, websites that you would recommend for those who may want to delve into, say, maybe the science of uh, the pro-life movement, the arguments for the pro-life movement? One book I really liked was uh, Frank Beckwith. Um, he's now he's a revert to Catholicism. He actually wrote a book on the uh, philosophy of the uh, pro-life movement. He, that's a very good one. So would you have, do you have any uh, recommendations for um, those who want to uh, delve deep into the uh, relevant issues? Yeah, so I won't recommend a book, but I will recommend a website um, or an organization. I am a huge fan of Secular Pro-Life. Um, it's actually founded by some very close friends of mine, so I'm a little biased, but I think they do absolutely excellent work. Um, they're obviously not coming from the same place as us because they're atheist, um, agnostic at least, um, but the ones I know personally are, are, are atheists, um, and they're pro-life atheists. Uh, and so that means that their arguments and their evidence are all going to be very, very strictly evidence-based, science-based, uh, as objective as possible. And so I think that's a, a great place to, to go. And, and they have excellent analysis. They do a lot of their own research. All of it is very, very well sourced. Um, so so that's going to be my recommendation. Uh, I think Secular Pro-Life does great work. I'll include the link in the uh, show notes to this uh, for those. Because it I'm aware of that website. Um, it, it does kind of show like it's not a religious person versus non-religious person debate. I mean, there, it's like um, loads of other issues. It, yeah, religion may inform why personally you are pro-life to some degree. You know, it is for me, but at the same time, that's not the only reason. There's embryology, there's the moral arguments and so forth. It's not like if you're an atheist, ergo, you must accept it. The pro choice position. No, I think the yeah. atheist position is, if anything, it's more important as an atheist to be pro life because that's all you've got. You have one life and there, there's nothing else. You know, as a Latter day Saint, we can have, we don't know what happens to, to, after an abortion um you know the, the most comforting idea might be maybe the soul gets to try again maybe i don't know but at a minimum there's life after death so there there's some solace if you if you're a pro-life religious person if you're a pro-life atheist this is it this is the one shot so if anything it's it's more acute um from an atheist perspective to stand for human rights because we've you know, th this one mortal life is, is all anybody gets. And so to be deprived of that is to be deprived of literally everything. And there's no recompense possible. Yeah, not to bring politics too much into this, but like uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm actually a libertarian, more of the Ron Paul type, not the take your clothes off your Spike Cohen type. But there is the uh, non-aggression policy. And I do think that's a very good way, even if one is atheistic in their uh, worldview, to actually argue for, and rather convincingly, for the pro-life movement once you realize that it's not just a come of cells, it's something personal. And therefore, the non-aggression policy, the NAP, does kind of kick in. And I think that's a very good segue into like the other things as well. If um, one is either libertarian-minded and or even atheistically minded, but they do believe in the existence of like, morals and so forth, and not simply as social constructs, it's it's pretty important as well. So one thing I do want to I, – I, I'm happy to come back and we can go into like the actual arguments around abortion. I think those would be good. Definitely. But one thing I just wanted to emphasize is that the pro-choice side really wants to put all the emphasis on on the women. and They want you to look away from, from the child that's, that's involved in the question. And they also want to tell you that the pro-life side is doing the opposite and that the pro-life side wants you to just see the child and completely ignore the interests of the women. And that – is not what the pro-life movement is about. And so we haven't talked a lot about in this conversation, it just hasn't really come up, but the the the, the cost of pro-life legislation on, on, on women, um, and I don't really think there is, I think pro-life legislation is pro-women legislation, but I do think that um, obviously pregnancy is hard on women and that abortion is complicated um, and that I believe the pro-life movement really genuinely is concerned with both the welfare of mothers and their children. Uh, and I emphatically am concerned with that. And so the one other site I'll, I'll recommend as well is Feminist for Life. Um, I think it's really, really, really important to be able to see the feminist perspective on abortion because there is one. Um, all of the early kind of first wave feminists, they were all emphatically pro-life. Um, and there is still a strong but minority pro-life feminism today. And so if you really want to understand the pro-life movement, I think it's important to understand that we're not just saying, oh, we have to preserve the, the life of the child and we don't care about the mother. Um, the pro-life movement is 
absolutely equally invested in the well-being of mothers and their children. And we're looking for both policies and then also just kind of attitudes and a culture that genuinely supports both. It is not enough to just say abortion should be illegal and tough luck women in crisis pregnancy. That's not a pro-life attitude. The pro-life attitude has to be, yeah, we're going to make abortion illegal, elective abortion illegal, because that it's a form of homicide and we can't accept it. But we're going to go further and we're going to do everything that we can to support women, to support mothers and to care for them. And and this is I can't go into the argument because we don't have time here, but this is why I'm referencing to Feminist for Life, that actually making elective abortion illegal is a pro woman policy. Um, and I emphatically believe that. And, and, and Feminist for Life has some really, really great resources that kind of flesh out the reasoning and the, and the logic behind that. Oh, thanks for that. I'll include the link into that website as well. And for those who are listening, uh, Nathaniel only has like 60 minutes uh, today, so we're going to rush through things, but hopefully we can actually definitely have a part two where we can flesh out some of these other issues as well. So um, uh, before we end, uh, thank you again, for Nathaniel, for coming on. I do greatly appreciate it. I'll include uh, the relevant links to about your forthcoming book um, published by Ermans and your website, uh, your blog, and other places as well as the uh, two websites you mentioned. Um, and it, for those who may want to like get into contact with you, um, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, I'm on Twitter, just at Nathaniel Gibbons. Um, yeah, so and I, I will say that Nathaniel's doing really great work when it comes to his commentary on the uh, Book of Mormon. Um, really cool insights, and um, I'm not sure if someone has actually told you this, but maybe you should try to publish it in a volume someday. It's uh, a lot of really cool insights. So Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. There's just a lot of background research I have to do to go from interesting Twitter thread to article, um, but I'm really hoping to do it and, and hoping to publish uh, in the not too distant future. Well, if you're looking for people to help review it, you know, uh, you can send it my way. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, definitely do follow him on Twitter. Uh, a lot of really cool information he shares uh, rather frequently as well. And also he's a fellow Star Trek fan, so you can't fault him for that, right? But uh, with that I being am. said, yeah, yeah. But hopefully we definitely will have you on for like a follow-up where we're going to flesh out some of the other topics you touched upon as well near the end. Um, I think they have to be discussed, especially embryology and the science of embryology and the effects upon women and the whole, well, the pro-life movement hates women, you know, um, that kind of uh, nonsense, but, you know, it's popular. So we definitely will have you on for part two. And hopefully once the book comes out, we'll definitely have you on um, to discuss it and give an overview of it as well. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to. With that, to. Um, thanks again for your time and uh, enjoy the uh, rest of your day and the, uh, your, the weekend as well. Thank you. You too.